In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth, and the earth was void and empty, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved over the waters, and God said, Be light made, and light was made. And God said, Let there be a firmament made amidst the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. God also said, let the waters that are under the heaven be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and so it was done. God in his almighty creative power brought forth the earth and all that we know to exist upon the earth by means of a single word. He also made the vast and immense universe with a single word. This means that by a simple act of his will, all of the complexity of creation was made in a single instant each thing according to his order and according to his word. All creation, from the highest of the angels down to the most insignificant stone, is in some way an imitation of the divine essence. Each of God's creatures existed as a divine idea from all eternity in the divine mind. When our blessed Lord pronounced the words of consecration upon the bread and wine at the Last Supper, he called upon this same infinite creative power of his divine nature to accomplish something which was more remarkable than all creation taken together. The change of the substance of bread into the substance of his body and the change of the wine into the substance of his blood. He did this with a word. He willed it. And so it was done. God has given to man a participation in his creative power by the conception of a child in holy matrimony. For this reason, parents are said to procreate, that is, to help in the creation of a child. The parents provide the body and God infuses the soul. It is for this reason, namely, that the conception of a child involves primarily the creative power of God by a direct intervention, that all things which pertain to human reproduction must be in accordance with the natural law, which is merely a reflection of God's law. We come here today, however, to confer a power which far exceeds the participation with God's creative act which parents enjoy. It is to confer upon these mortal human beings made of dust the participation in the most extraordinary creative power of God exceeding infinitely that of the conception of a child, or by its effect, that of the creation of the entire universe. I am speaking of the power to change bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. Although it is true that the greatest act of creation is to make something from nothing, 
Nonetheless, from the point of view of the dignity of the effect, the power which we will confer upon these ordinands today far exceeds the power to create natural things. For the sun is merely fire. The moon is merely a stone. These things are vile and insignificant in the eyes of God and are desirable only in as much as they serve his purposes. Today, however, we will confer upon these ordinands a participation in God's creative power whereby he has the power over the entire being of a creature. It is within God's power to instantly change a frog into a prince and a prince into a frog For he has control over the entire being of each of those things. Consequently, the power which our Lord used at the Last Supper in changing the bread and wine into his body and blood was none other than the creative power of his divine nature proper to God alone. It is a participation in this power which we will confer today. For when the priest consecrates, he does not say, this is the body of Christ. But he says, this is my body, as if he were Christ himself. And he performs the marvelous change of substance in an instant with these simple words. As when God said, let there be light, and there was light. St. Bernard of Clairvaux said, the power of the priest is similar to the power of the divine persons, because in the transubstantiation of the bread, there is necessary a power that is as great as what is required for the creation of the world. And St. Jerome said, by the mere sign of the will of God, the heavens appeared. The earth came out of nothing. We see a similar power in the sacramental words, he said. In an analogous way, our Blessed Lady participated in the creative power of God by giving her simple fiat at the Annunciation. Just as Christ's presence in the Holy Eucharist is dependent on the action of the priest, so was the incarnation of the Word dependent upon the action of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Consequently, the priest is to the Holy Eucharist, which is the substantial and real presence of Christ in our tabernacles, what Our Lady is to the incarnation of the second person of the Blessed Trinity in her womb. No one, however, not even a priest, has as intimate a participation in the creative act of God as did the Blessed Virgin Mary. There is no possible way in which to come closer to God than to be the mother of God. Nonetheless, we should perceive from this similarity, this analogy, the close relationship of the priest to the Blessed Virgin Mary. St. Augustine said, O venerable dignity of priests, in their hands the Son of God becomes incarnate as in the womb of Mary.
In the joyous mysteries of the Holy Rosary, we contemplate the joy of having Christ with us. He is our Emmanuel, which means God with us. What a consolation this is. What a joyful day Christmas Day is. God with us begins with the Annunciation, the incarnation of God in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Then we see the joy of Elizabeth in the second of those mysteries. As she greets the Mother of God, but even more, the joy of the infant John the Baptist as he leapt for joy in the womb of his mother Elizabeth because of the very presence of Christ in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. In the third mystery, we experience the joy of the shepherds who see the Christ child and that of the Magi (coughs) to whom was revealed the mystery of the incarnation of the second person of the Blessed Trinity. In the fourth mystery, we see the joy of Simeon and Anna as they behold the infant Jesus. And in the fifth mystery, we behold the the devastation in the hearts of Mary and Saint Joseph because they are separated from the presence of Christ, only to be consoled by being with him again in the temple. This is the joy of God with us. Our blessed Lord, however, did not come simply to be among us on this mortal earth, this earth of sin, of disease, and of death. St. Paul said, a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus (coughs) came into this world to save sinners. St. Augustine said, there was no cause for Christ's coming except to save sinners. Take away the sick, (coughs) take away the wounds, and there is no need for medicine. If the great physician came from heaven, it is because the whole world was lying sick. That very sick man is the human race. Our Lord came to draw us to himself, He came as our Emmanuel, God with us, in order that we be with God. He came to join us to himself in his mystical body, the Holy Catholic Church, and through faith, contrition for sin, the sacraments, actual grace and sanctifying grace, and the love of God to rise from the dead and to make us ascend to heaven with him and reign there forever with the beatific vision. So just as the immediate purpose (coughs) of the Incarnation is God with us, so the ultimate purpose of the Incarnation is we with God. This being so, we pass into the sorrowful mysteries of the Rosary where our blessed Lord pays the price for our sins in order precisely to detach us from the thraldom of Satan and to attach us to himself as our shepherd and king. This sacrifice of his body and blood on the hill of Calvary affects this release from the power of sin. Finally, in the glorious mysteries, we celebrate our union and our attachment to our Lord, our Redeemer. By rising from the dead, he gives us resurrection from the dead. By ascending into heaven, he promises our future ascension into heaven, body and soul, at the end of the world. In the third mystery, we celebrate the means which he gives us for this joyful and glorious transformation of our lives namely the gift of the Holy Ghost who brings to us sanctifying grace, the theological virtues, the infused moral virtues, and the seven gifts of the Holy Ghost. This is our spiritual organism, just as your body is an organism. Those gifts of the Holy Ghost and sanctifying grace is your spiritual organism 
by which to posit good works, love of God, and go to heaven. The third person of the Blessed Trinity grants us this spiritual organism, just as you have your bodies. In the fourth mystery, we see Our Lady, the archetype of redeemed man, being transported to heaven in anticipation of the resurrection of the dead on the last day. Finally, we see her crowned in glory, which gives us the hope of our, our own future glory in recompense for the many crosses which we have generously borne in this life. <clears throat> our blessed Lord, in his infinite wisdom, has given us in this life, in the Holy Eucharist, both God with us and we with God. On the one hand, he has given the consolation of possessing him even on this earth of death, this valley of tears, as we say in the Hail Holy Queen, by having his abiding presence in our tabernacles. He is truly with us all days until the consummation of the world, as he said. He would never have ascended into heaven, St. Alphonsus says, unless he could have left us this abiding presence among us. He has not left us orphans. He is truly God with us. But on the other hand, by placing himself under the species of humble bread and wine, he in a most marvelous way also draws us to himself. St. Thomas points out that when we eat ordinary food, we assimilate it to ourselves. But, he says, St. Thomas, the opposite is true. When we receive our blessed Lord in the Eucharist, he assimilates us to himself. We become a part of him that is united to him in his mystical body. It is for this reason that the Holy Eucharist is the sacrament of the unity of the church and likewise for this reason that it is a grave sacrilege to give the Holy Eucharist to non-Catholics. In like ma manner, the priest also, by his mere instrumentality in giving us the Holy Eucharist, is in a certain manner of speaking God with us. St. Gregory Nazianzen said, the priest is the defender of truth. He praises God with the angels. Together with Jesus Christ, he exercises the sacred functions. He returns to the creator his transformed image. He acts as a celestial worker. Even more than that, he is a God who makes gods out of men. The priest applies to us the effects of Christ's redemption through the Mass and the sacraments. He is God's representative on earth. But like Christ, the main purpose of the priest is not merely to make Christ present to this corruptible world, but is instead to draw men out of the world and lead them to an eternity of perfect happiness with God in heaven. St. Jerome said, God willed that the priests be the saviors of the world. The other remarkable power which the priest receives is that of releasing men from their sins. Of all of the problems that beset human beings, by far the worst is the problem of mortal sin whereby they are opposed to God in permanent enmity and face an eternity of torment. I say permanent enmity because it is impossible for man by his own natural powers to extricate himself from this stain of sin and from the condemnation which awaits him at judgment. He is like someone at the bottom of a well and cannot get out of it unless God throws him a rope. The guilt of mortal sin 
is like an enormous chain upon a person's soul which forever binds him to servitude to the devil and to eternal death. It is the worst thing that can ever happen to you. The priest receives the power at his ordination to break these chains. Although mortal sin is the worst evil that can befall a man, it is the easiest from which to be released. By the power of holy orders, the mere words of the priest, just like God's word in creation. The words of the priest in the sacrament of penance solves everything and restores man to the testimony of a good conscience and friendship with God. Just as with a few words he calls down the presence of God upon the altar, so with a few words he destroys the state of mortal sin and restores the soul to supernatural life. So just as the priest participates in the creative power of God through the consecration at Mass, so does he participate in the redemptive power of God in the sacrament of penance. St. Augustine said, It is a greater work and a more astonishing marvel to make a sinner a just man than to create heaven and earth. The priest, therefore, restores peace of soul and the testimony of a clean conscience, which are goods that not all of the gold in the world could buy. We celebrate today the martyrdom of St. Peter and Paul. St. Paul said, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. He also said, who then shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or famine or nakedness or danger or persecution or a sword as it is written, for thy sake, we are put to death all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. But in all these things we overcome because of him that hath loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor might, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. <clears throat> While bishops and priests may perish by the sword or by the guillotine, the bayonet or the firing squad, and many of them did, over the ages of the church and by other means of torture and death, murder, thereby achieving a glorious martyrdom. Nonetheless, neither the episcopacy nor the, the priesthood will perish by these instruments of death, nor will the, these sacred orders perish by a yet more clever tool of the devil for the destruction of the Catholic faith, far more efficacious than the bayonet or the guillotine. I am referring to the spirit of compromise with the modernists. The ultimate assault upon the Catholic Church is modernism, St. Pius X told us, worse than anything that has hit the Church in the past. It was institutionalized and propagated by Vatican II the plan was to use the authority of the Pope, only apparent authority to be sure, to completely transform the Catholic Church into a dogmaless humanitarianism. No dogmas, just preach the good, the earthly good of man. And this was told to us by a priest by the name of Monsignor de la Suisse in France in a book that was written more than a hundred years ago called The Anti-Christian Conspiracy. He used those very words, dogmaless humanitarianism, 
and we see it every day exuding from the Vatican. It is precisely this dogmaless humanitarianism which we behold within the walls of the church today and which is being presented to us as if it were the Catholic faith. We have taken a very firm stand against modernism and the modernist occupants of the Vatican and the Episcopal Seas, unlike some fraternities and groups. The solution to the problem in the church does not rest with a coexistence with modernism, but with the defeat of modernism, the crushing of modernism, as the ultimate tool of the devil to destroy souls. More souls have been destroyed by modernism than, all, than those destroyed by all of the heresies combined in the history of the church, all of the schisms, all of the persecutions. More loss of faith in a mere 60 years than all of those things that have beset the church. Three centuries of putting Christians to death in the early church. More than that, millions, billions of people who call themselves Catholic but do not have the Catholic faith. In the face of coming persecution, as the prince of this world every single day gathers his forces to create an antichrist, we must say this, nothing, nothing, will extinguish the Catholic episcopacy or the Catholic priesthood. Nothing will extinguish the Catholic mass and nothing will extinguish Catholic doctrine and nothing will extinguish the Catholic faith, even if we must attest to the truth of these things with our blood. We commend these young men today to the Blessed Virgin Mary, with whom, as I have said, the priest has many things in common. May their entire priestly lives be one of purity, sanctity, and virtue. May they edify the faithful and edify the church so that they do not appear on the pages of church history as one of the members of the clergy who harm the church by scandal but as one of the clergy who honored the sanctity of the church by the stainless conduct of his priestly life. We live in an age when priests are scandalous, praying as they do on innocent and trusting victims. Let me be clear. The Catholic priesthood must be as stainless as the Immaculate Heart of Mary. just as she was preserved from all sin because she was chosen to bear Christ in her womb, to care for him and be devoted to him, so the priest receives at his ordination an almost identical calling. Let these priests therefore resolve today to accept death rather than to commit a mortal sin a single mortal sin. St. Dominic Savio, who was not even a priest, a young man, said, death but not sin. Let them have that motto all through their lives. Let them overcome the scandals of the clergy by the beauty of their morals and their devotion, their piety and sanctity. And let them renew that sacred resolution every day of their lives with all their might to remove from their souls every habit of venial sin. Only Our Lady was pr totally preserved from all sin, even venial sin, by a special grace. But priests must strive even against their habits of venial sin so that they be perfect, as perfect as, as they can be in God's will. Let them confess frequently. Let them constantly examine themselves so that they may be pure priests, faithful priests, and priests who edify the faithful with their words, their behavior, and their demeanor. 
May they always lift the faithful whenever they speak to them or in any way have any contact with them. Let them lift them up to God and never draw them down. There was a Protestant man who once visited the Curie of Ars, St. John Vianney, and came away from his encounter with him and said this, I have just seen God in a man. May each of these ordinands be such a priest. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.